I think we're going to look back in five years' time and say, whoa, uh, this is a lot different than what we had in 2022. So you're probably wondering what a ruined Greek temple has got to do with batteries and solar panels. And then uh, how about this one? That's one of a series of Norman cathedrals that were built in Sicily between 1100 and 1200. And they all look like that inside. Those are all little tiles the size of your thumbnail uh, with gold leaf and colors. There was this incredible explosion, artistic and scientific architectural explosion uh, between 1100 and 1200 in Sicily. And that's where that Greek temple is, that ruined temple. And Terry and I were there uh, during the early weeks of the Ukraine war. And it made me think about our incredible ability to be so creative and to do amazing things when we put our minds to it. And then our ability to tear it all down. And of course the Greeks got destroyed by the Romans and the Romans by the Carthaginians and the Carthaginians by the Romans and the Romans by the, uh, the German tribes. Uh, and the reason I throw this in there is because I think we're going through one of those periods in history where we've got this explosion of creativity and talent and engineering. And, uh, and we've also, obviously with the war in Ukraine, got the uh, uglier side of our nature on full display. And if you think about it, when I first went cruising with Terry, which was 40 years ago, the, uh, a computer filled a room and was fed with punch cards. There was no GPS system. I'm not even sure it would even be thought, thought of. Uh, the idea of electronic charts had definitely not been thought about. Uh, there were no cell phones. There was no internet. The internet hadn't even been thought about. Um, and all of these things have been created in the last three or four decades. And that pace of development is ongoing and maybe even accelerating. And all of this is spilling over into the energy field, which is what we're going to talk about today. And obviously the, the boating community is a, a complete irrelevance in terms of the big picture here. I mean, whatever is gonna happen is gonna happen because of other people and other, other issues. But we're gonna be the beneficiaries of many of the changes that are taking place. So I wanted to look a little bit at that big picture and how that's influencing the developments in the, in the battery world and the solar panel world, and then how that might spill down into the boating world. So obviously the driving force for much of this is global warming. Um, there's a near universal acceptance that it does actually exist. And there's also a pretty broad acceptance that we need to do something about it although there's not much uh, agreement on exactly what we're going to do about it. But uh, there is a, a pretty uh, broad consensus developing that we're going to electrify our way out of global warming if we're going to do it at all. And so we're getting a huge focus on electrification, especially in transportation. And this is sparking an, an unbelievable amount of investment and uh, research and so on. And we're seeing already cars, for example, that have got a 300 mile range we'll have electric pickup trucks within a year or two and electric 18 wheelers. So uh, we, we've got this huge movement on the transportation front in, to electrify everything. And then superimposed on this, the last couple of years we've had COVID and all of the su supply chain issues that, that has created. And now we've got the war in Ukraine, which has demonstrated rather dramatically the limits of globalization. Uh, I think the theory has been that if we're nice to China and Russia, and we allow them to develop, they'll become part of the club. And uh, we've realized that this is not working. So we're going to pull in our horns and we're focusing a lot more research and productive energy back home and the same as occurring in Europe. And these are all shifting the, the background for uh, what's gonna happen in our boat systems. And in particularly on the renewable energy front, we've basically licensed uh, electric motor construction and battery construction and lithium ion construction to the Chinese. And we're beginning to realize that that's a mistake. And we're pumping significant amounts of resources into doing this at home. The uh, Biden's Build Back Better Act, which as we all know is stalled, 
contains billions of dollars for electrification and, and for battery development and so on. So it's a reflection of the fact that at least a significant segment of US society is recognizing that we need to do more R&D and more investment at home. Uh, and of course, we don't have agreement on that because it's not going anywhere at the moment, but the ground is shifting beneath our feet uh, as we're talking. So the goal is to get carbon neutral transportation. And there's two ways of doing that. One is to have point of use carbon neutral energy production, which means that whatever we need to power the car or the truck or the boat, we, we create it on the vehicle itself. Uh, but effectively the only mechanisms we've got to do that are solar power and fuel cells. And uh, we'll look at, in more detail at solar uh, and I will skim a little bit on fuel cells, but they're not making any, getting any traction in the boat world. So if we can't produce the energy as we use it, then we've got to store it somehow. And the only effective mechanism we have for storing electrical energy on boats at the moment is on batteries. And it's the same in the transportation sector. That's why we've got such an enormous investment in battery technology for cars and trucks and, and uh, 18 wheelers and so on. Uh, and of course, this doesn't get us anywhere in terms of carbon reduction if the energy source to recharge those batteries then comes from a coal fired power station or an oil fired power station. So there has to be carbon neutral energy sources to make this whole thing pencil out. So we have a real problem in the boat world. Uh, which is the duty cycle of a boat is totally different to the duty cycle of a car. When you accelerate a car, there's a high energy demand during acceleration. And then once you get up to cruising speeds on the internet, on the, on the interstate, so long as there's no headwinds and you're not going uphill, the loads are relatively light. And that's how come we can get a 300 mile range out of a Tesla. Uh, a boat is totally different. The acceleration loads are lower because we've got propeller slip. So we don't have that physical connection between the rubber and the road. Uh, and that reduces the load. But as we speed up, especially in a displacement hull, the hull resistance curve goes up exponentially. So once we get to cruising speeds, the loads are permanently high. So then we need an enormous amount of energy to keep us there. And there's physically at the moment, no electrical energy storage mechanism with a high enough energy density to give us any significant range capability under electric propulsion. I mean, there are some exceptions. You see these, um, these boats that are custom built for operating under solar power where they've got massively wide decks and they've got very super efficient hulls and they're not livable because they couldn't afford to put any weight in the boats. So it is possible to move a boat solely on the, on the non-fossil fuel sources, but it's not a practical choice for any of us that actually want to use our boats on a day-to-day -day basis. We just simply don't have a mechanism to store enough electrical energy to do it. And in practical terms, most electric propulsion on boats the, uh, the range limit today is, is typically about one hour at cruising speed. So if it's a seven knot cruising speed, you've got a seven mile range. If you've got a boat that does 20 knots, it's a 20 mile range. But by and large, um, anybody that tries to get more than a one hour at cruising speed, they can't afford the batteries or they couldn't fit them in the boat. And even if we could, we have no shoreside infrastructure to recharge them. So if we all got electric boats and went back to the dock and plugged in, um, we'd crash the shoreside power supply. And we'll talk a bit more about that as well, because that's an issue. Uh, the only country I know that's investing significantly in, in marina uh, electrical supply is Norway, because they want their boaters to be able to go electric boating all up the coast of Norway from marina to marina and to plug in and recharge. And uh, this kind of investment is not gonna come at the marina level, it has to have some national impetus behind it. The core issue here is energy density, how much energy you can stuff into a given volume or, or weight. And up the side, we're looking at volume and across the bottom of weight. So it's uh, watt hours is the unit we're using to measure energy storage. Watt hours per liter or watt hours per kilogram, we're using kilogram for weight. Um, and you can see the lead acid technology, which is what we all have, is really at the bottom end of the scale, both in terms of 
energy density from a volumetric point of view and also from a weight point of view. And we go through NICADs and nickel metal hydride, and then we've got lithium ion batteries, which is, which is the peak of the capabilities we've got at the moment. So if we look at how much energy we can store in for a given weight, and we look at lead acid batteries, that's the PBA is the acronym for lead acid. We look at AGM batteries, which are generally speaking, the highest den energy density lead acid batteries we've got. We can theoretically get about 30 to 50 watt hours per kilogram. So, and again, we don't need to know the units or really remember the numbers. This is just to give an overall view of what's going on. With lithium ion, we're talking at the moment about 100 to 265 watt hours per kilogram. So, so maybe five times as much theoretical storage. And then when we get to diesel fuel, we're looking at four and a half thousand watt hours per kilogram. So there's the problem right there. Um, we, we just don't have the uh, ability to equal the energy density of, of diesel. But then it gets even worse because when we use a lead acid battery bank, we try not to fully discharge it. In fact, we try not to go much below 50% state of charge and we often don't go beyond 80% on the recharge. So we're using about 30%. So instead of having 30 to 50 watt hours per kilogram of usable capacity, we've got 10 to 25 because the rest of it is not being used. If we do the same formula with lithium ion, you can use about 70% of that. Um, we get 70 to 185. And when you go to diesel, we can use 100% of it because we can run the tank until it's dry. So it gets even worse than the nominal stuff. But then we got one more step where things start to actually perk up a little bit. Uh, if we attach an electric motor to that lead acid battery or the lithium ion battery, those um, motors can be made 80% uh, efficient. So we've got another 20% loss we can build in here in terms of our energy storage that we're dissipating as heat. But when we attach a diesel engine to that tank of diesel, it's only 10 to 30% efficient. Uh, much of the time when we're running our diesel engines, particularly if we're running a generator long hours, we're lucky if we get 10% fuel efficiency. So that drops the productive watt hours per kilogram down dramatically for the diesel engine. So we start to narrow the gap here between lithium ion and diesel, it's still big, but uh, when we look at the productive side of the watt hours per kilogram, uh, the gap is not uh, nearly as outrageous as it looks like up front. So some other uh, issues we have to take into account here when we're looking at the energy side of these boats is what it takes to recharge those batteries. Assuming we could put enough on the boat to drive it for a reasonable length of time. If we're using flooded lead acid batteries, the type you top up, they're only 60% efficient. That means that when we recharge the battery, 40% of the energy that we're putting into the battery is actually being turned into heat. It's not putting electrical energy back in the battery. And uh, that heat, if we try to fast charge lead acid batteries, they get really hot. I mean, I've got scorch marks in the bottom, bottom of my battery box from pushing these systems hard in my testing. Um, and of course you can drive these batteries into something called thermal runaway. Gel cells are about 75% efficient, AGM is about 85, lithium ion is 95. Um, so that's pretty damn efficient, but even 5% energy losses, if you're pushing the batteries fairly hard, which we in inevitably do in electric propulsion applications, generates a significant amount of heat. And if you don't get the heat out of the batteries, um, then you've got a serious problem with lithium ion because you've got the potential for the battery to, to go into thermal runaway and catch fire. Some other metrics we have to look at is the charge acceptance rates. With lead acid batteries, I think most of you know that once you get beyond about 50 or 60% state of charge, the charge acceptance rate, the, the speed with which you can charge the battery goes down very rapidly. So if you want to fully recharge a lead acid battery uh, and it's say 50% discharged when you start, uh, you're going to have to run the, the generator or the battery charger or whatever for, for at least two to three hours minimum to fully recharge the battery because of that tapering charge acceptance rate. Um, within the car industry, um, they have another measure of this, which I'm going to use, which is called dynamic charge acceptance. With When we look at charge acceptance rates in the boat world, we're just looking at how many amps can we put into a battery at a given state of charge. Within the, the car world, they're looking at the fact that the the battery charge is going up and down as the car is going down the highway. Maybe they break and they get some braking energy 
and then uh, maybe they uh, they use some electric propulsion. So they're looking at the dynamic charge acceptance rate, and uh, they need to get that to be pretty high, much higher than it is right now. So we're going to use that metric rather than absolute charge acceptance. And then, of course, the cycle life. How many times can we discharge a battery and recharge it? Uh, in the car industry, they need much higher cycle life than they've got right now for hybrid vehicles. Uh, then if we don't fully recharge that battery, we don't want to run the generator for hours or we don't want to run the main engine battery charging at anchor. Um, the batteries go into a condition known as sulfation where we can't uh, fully recharge them in the future. They lose capacity. So we have this problem with partial state of charge operation. That's when we don't fully recharge the battery every few weeks. And uh, we've been, that's one of the major killers of both batteries. And then of course, we've got the cost of batteries, which is high. And there's different ways of quantifying this. One is just in absolute terms, here's this battery, which stores X amount of energy in theory. And this is how much it costs. So if it's a $200 battery and it stores two kilowatt hours of electricity, it's costing us $100 per kilowatt hour, but that's not a very useful metric. So another way to look at this is how many times can we discharge that battery and recharge it? So over the life of the battery, how much energy goes in and out of that battery before it fails? That's the throughput energy. And then we see what the battery costs. And then we figure out how much it costs us for every kilowatt hour of energy that we put into that battery and took back out later on over the life of the battery. And if we run those numbers, we find right now most of our lead acid batteries are costing us between 30 cents and a dollar a kilowatt hour for the energy that we've put through the battery. So I don't know what you pay for electricity in Alaska, but I bet it's between 10 and 20 cents a kilowatt hour. And here we are, we're paying an overhead. This isn't the cost of making the energy, it's the cost of storing it of 30 cents to a dollar a kilowatt hour, just for the privilege of storing that energy in a battery and taking it back out again. So that's the throughput cost. And then we've got to recharge the battery. So, and if we're running a generator, uh, long hours and we're fully recharging a lead acid battery, so we're in the final stages of charging. So the generator is doing almost no work whatsoever, but we've got a 10 or $15,000 generator with a 5,000 hour life expectancy, it's costing us three or four bucks an hour to run it, regardless of whether it does any useful work. We, we discover that the cost of that recharge energy is pretty high. Hmm. Um, so that's the other factor. And the greater the inefficiency in the batteries, the higher the recharge cost. So those two things are critical in terms of keeping down the, the cost of the energy on our boats. The one is the charge acceptance rate of the batteries. So we can load up our charging devices. And the, the other is, the, is what this does to the recharge energy cost. So uh, I've got all of those things now I want kind of floating around in the background. 20 or 30 years ago, the lead industry realized that lithium ion batteries were potentially a problem. 85% uh, of the world's lead goes into batteries. So the lead industry put together something called the Advanced Lead Acid Battery Consortium, uh, which is an, an accumulation of the leading AGM battery companies around the world. They got them all to get together, even though they're competing against each other. And they persuaded them to all collectively invest in a fundamental R&D, or what they call pre-competitive research and development. This is a research at a level that is not going to have any immediate payback. So the companies don't want to spend the money because it, it hits the bottom line. So collectively, they're willing to work together to discover new things and then they'll take those and they'll compete against each other and how they apply them. And over the last two or three decades, they've spent tens of millions of dollars of uh, lead industry and AGM money trying to improve primarily AGM batteries. And one of the things that they particularly focused on uh, is how to improve the performance of these batteries by incorporating carbon into the battery in various ways. And uh, there's been some significant improvement in battery technology as a result of this. So the only battery on the market today that has a substantial amount of carbon is the Firefly battery, which one or two of you may have. It actually has plates in the negative plates. They're made of a carbon foam. This is carbon. No, that's actually the positive plate. The next one is, this is all carbon foam. And there is no grid structure, which a normal battery has. That's the backside of one of these plates. It's just a sheet of foam. Uh, and then they glue 
or they fasten these strips of lead to the front, which is how they get the electrons in and out of the plate. But fundamentally, it's a piece of carbon with the active material in the battery pasted into it. This technology was developed by Caterpillar back in the early 2000s. And then they set it up in a separate company, Firefly, in 2007, right before the recession. And in the recession, Firefly went bankrupt and the technology got bought by an Indian battery company. So, and they have the patents. So it's been a technology blocker because this company has not had the resources to take the, the development any further, but nobody else is able to use this carbon foam technology until the patents expire. So it's been a bit of a problem for everybody. Uh, however, the industry has been working hard uh, finding workarounds around this. And we've now got a company in New Zealand with carbon felt batteries, and we've got various other ways in which we've sprinkled carbon into the active material in our batteries. Um, the uh, North Star battery company and their blue top batteries, they all have carbon sprinkled into the active material. Uh, the latest generation of Victron batteries have uh, carbon doping in some way or another. And uh, these all improve two things, the cycle life to a small extent, and also the ability to operate in a partial state of charge so that you don't have to fully recharge the battery so often and go through that extended charge cycle. The Firefly batteries are immune to sulfation. I have run them for months at a time in a partial state of charge, and then I've left them for eight months in a 30% state of charge, and then I put them on a normal charge cycle and they come back to a full state of charge. There's no other battery on the market that'll do that. Um, I would recommend them to everybody, except for the fact that they have intermittent quality control problems at the factory. Uh, and they've been going through another round of these in the last year or two, I think because of COVID. Uh, and uh, because the technology is brilliant, but I honestly can't recommend the batteries to people at the moment because the QC issues are pretty outrageous. Even though the US at the federal level has not been uh, very visibly investing much in these kinds of developments and technology. And in actual fact, behind the scenes, there's been a significant amount of investment through the National Science Foundation and other mechanisms. And in particular, we have in the US some what we call our national laboratories. And the Argonne National Laboratory has now partnered up with the US subset of that consortium for battery innovation. They, and they're not allowed to partner with overseas companies, but they've basically partnered with all of the major AGM manufacturers that are US based. And at the Argonne National Laboratory, they have technology where they can actually study what's going on inside a lead acid battery uh, at the fundamental levels of physics and chemistry while the battery is in use. We've never had this capability before. Well, all experimentation has been empirical. You make a change to the uh, grid structure or to the electrolyte and then you test the battery and then you chop it up and see what happens. But now we can see what's going on in real time. And the Europeans have similar capabilities, which they're now putting to use in lead acid battery research. And one of the core focuses here is uh, to unlock capability that we know lead acid batteries theoretically have almost double the energy density that we're actually getting out of them. We don't know why we can't unlock that other half of the energy density. So if they can get anywhere close to figuring that out, uh, we could get lead acid batteries, the same physical size and weight that we have right now with twice the capacity. So some really interesting things going on in the lead acid world. You, you'd think after 150 years, we know everything there is to know about lead acid batteries, but we're actually discovering uh, more and faster at the moment than we ever have in the history of these batteries. So the Consortium for Battery Innovation has a whole listing of different functions for batteries. And I just picked five of them out here, but they have 15 or 20 of them. Uh, and two of that are of particular interest to us are energy storage systems. So uh, this is fundamentally grid stabilization. If you have a ton of solar and we're putting more and more solar in our national grids, and you get a cloud goes over a big solar farm, the output drops almost instantaneously. And then the cloud moves on and the output comes back up just as fast. So we get these huge energy spikes in the grid, um, which uh, conventional grid is not very well set up to handle, but batteries are really good at this. They can absorb those spikes and then they can spit that back when all of a sudden there's a need for energy. So we're getting 
um, a lot of research into energy storage systems, which in a, in a small kind of way, our house systems on our boats are an energy storage system. So whatever benefits we get from this research are going to spin off into our house applications. And then on the other side, we've got motive power, which is propulsion. So which is uh, electric propulsion for our boats or electric propulsion in cars. Uh, we have a ton of investment in improving lead acid batteries for that, not just lithium ion. And then the, the CBI has got all of these, what they call them KPIs, key performance indicators. And uh, we won't go through these in details, but the bottom line is that in the next three years, they expect to achieve major improvements in the performance in, in terms of cycle life, charge acceptance rates, ability to operate in a partial state of charge, energy density and reduction in cost. And then uh, by 2030, they're expecting to have a really substantial improvements. And these are not pie in the sky targets. These are targets that they think they're gonna meet. Uh, these are the challenges they've given to the industry, but they think they're all achievable. And then when we get to motive power, we've got the same thing. We've got a different set of targets because it's a different application, but we're looking at um, much higher charge acceptance rates, much higher cycle life, um, increased energy density, the ability to go from a 30% state of charge to 80% in less than an hour, uh, and a much higher cycle life and much higher energy throughput, uh, and also significantly lower cost. So, if, if they come anywhere close to hitting these targets, we're going to have uh, qualitatively better lead acid batteries in the marketplace than what we've got right now. And the nice thing about this, the, the automotive marketplace, is that they also need fairly small batteries. So when we're talking energy storage systems, we're talking grid scale battery packs that fit in containers. So the individual units might not fit in our boat. It depends how they break them down. When we're talking cars, if it'll fit in a car, it'll fit in a boat. So the likelihood is that we're going to get uh, technology here that is going to look really good to us. So that's it on the lead acid, but let's move into lithium mine because this is where the, the real advances are coming. Um, if you look at the energy density of lithium ion batteries, how much we can stuff into a given volume or, or for a given weight, starting in 1990, uh, coming to 2020, you have almost a straight line increase in energy density for uh, 20 or 30 years, and then it starts to level off. And we are actually getting moderately close to the theoretical limits of what we can do with lithium ion batteries in terms of energy density. So we're not gonna see a continuation of this line off of the graph with lithium ion technology. And that's a problem for us because as we've already seen, um, even with lithium ion batteries, it's hard to put enough in a boat to have significant electric propulsion capabilities. So unless we can fairly dramatically improve the energy density of lithium ion batteries or find some other energy dense electrical storage mechanism, uh, we're gonna have a continuing problem in terms of trying to move towards electric propulsion. I mean, we'll have, get terrific house systems where we don't need so much energy, but we won't um, have such good electric propulsion options. And then in terms of the cost per kilowatt hour at the cell level, so this is not the battery level, this is the cell level. Uh, in 1990, 10 to the power of four, that's $10,000 a kilowatt hour. And right now we're down around $200 a kilowatt hour. So that'll give you a sense. And again, it's almost a straight line reduction in cost over the decades as we get better technology and higher volumes. And there's actually a very interesting correlation between the cost per kilowatt hour of lithium ion and the number of patents that are filed in any given year. And the more patents that are filed, the more the cost goes down because people are discovering better ways to build the batteries and to make them cheaper. But, but I mentioned we're kind of getting near the theoretical limits of lithium ion. Right now, the peak is around 270 watt hours per kilogram. In theory, we might, we might get as high as 400. It's still a big increase. It's another 50%. Um, but it's not what we need to compete with diesel at 4,500. However, if we look at lithium metal, lithium ion is a way of, um, we, we get lithium and we extract salts from it and, and we turn it into an electrolyte. And um, but there's actually very little lithium in a lithium ion battery. But if we could make lithium batteries out of lithium metal, look at the energy density. We're going from a possible 400 watt hours per kilogram to 5,210. 
That's over a tenfold increase in energy density by going to a lithium metal battery. Now, we've known this since the 1970s, but the problem has been that nobody's been able to make a lithium metal battery that didn't immediately catch fire. Um, it's a rather volatile material. Um, but they've been working it, and they gave up working at it for a couple of decades, probably three decades. And then with this move towards electrification, uh, there was a refocus on making lithium metal batteries. And there's a lot of R&D going on in that field at the moment as to whether they can conquer these flammability issues and, and make a reliable, uh, safe battery with lithium metal. Because it will, it will qualitatively, once again, transform the energy density. This isn't an incremental increase. Uh, this is a huge change. We also, interestingly enough, uh, which is hard to imagine. If you take iron, for example, and grind it up into microscopic particles, and then you put it in an environment in which it rusts, each of those little particles rusts, you can get energy off it. You get you release electrons, and then you can reverse that cycle, and uh, you can basically deoxygenate the rust and turn it back into iron again. Um, and these are called metal air batteries. And there's a fair amount of R&D going on in various forms of metal air batteries. If we look at iron. Uh, we've got a theoretical energy density of 1400 uh, watt hours per kilogram, which is uh, three times the peak of lithium iron. Uh, and then various other metals, there's uh, quite a bit of research going on in zinc air bat batteries. So we may see some fairly radical breakthroughs in with different materials that are also way cheaper and easier to handle than uh, lithium iron and the other bits and pieces that go into a lithium iron battery. So a lot going on here. In general, uh, I get about every month uh, an email or two or a press release about some brilliant new development that's going to revolutionize the world. And uh, none of them ever materialize. So I just throw all those things in the bin. So I, I'm always reluctant to talk about this kind of forward looking technology because um, the likelihood is that I'm going to get a bloody nose over this. The reason I'm talking about this today is because. Tesla, Ford, BMW, GM, Volkswagen, they're all predicting radical breakthroughs within the next two years. Uh, they all say they've got the batteries working in the lab. And, and they're all investing tens of billions of dollars in this technology. So when we get those kind of players uh, going public and saying that they've got this technology working in the lab and it'll be in their cars in two years. And when we see them investing those kinds of sums, I think there's some substance here. Uh, Tesla is basically optimizing that type of cell structure that they've been using from day one, and they're making them a bit longer and a bit fatter, and, but they've changed the, the way they put them together. And they're increasing the energy density of those cells by about 40%. And they already have a factory that are building the new cells. So that's a pretty substantial hike in energy density. But, and then uh, Ford and BMW are partnering together and they're also developing an advanced lithium ion battery. So this is still the same technology we're using right now, um, but using something called a solid state electrolyte, which we don't need to get into. But the real stuff that's fascinating is GM and Volkswagen. Uh, both claim to have lithium metal batteries that they've now figured out how to make them safe and in low volume production, and that they will have them in their cars by 2025. And that's where we get this, this uh, qualitative breakthrough in energy density is if they can crack the metal side of this and get those batteries into production. And the final uh, point here is that all of these companies are predicting that their cost, uh, this is to the car maker at scale, is gonna be below $100 a kilowatt hour um, by 2025. So right now, if you buy a quality AGM battery, you're paying somewhere between $200 and $400 a kilowatt hour. So we're never gonna get the same costs as the car industry, but let's say they're three or four times as expensive. Uh, we'll still have lithium ion batteries with vastly better performance than lead acid batteries at a similar cost to what we're paying right now for high-end AGM batteries, if any of this stuff materializes. And then of course we get back to the fact that so we all put these batteries on our boats and, and we go boating for the week and we go plug in and we crash the shoreside substation. They have a lake in Austria where they banned fossil fueled engines. It's a big lake back in the 60s 
and the local boat builder got into electric boating way back then. And, and uh, there were a lot of sport boats on the lake, people that wanted to water ski. So they built boats with 40 and 50 and 100 kilowatt electric motors and huge battery packs. And uh, people could water ski for several hours behind the boat. Well, on a Saturday uh, afternoon, they all came back to the dock, having played around for the day, plugged in, and they crashed the substation to the town. I mean, not just for the marina, for the whole town. So they had to build a new substation for the town. And we're going to have similar kinds of issues. If we, we're going to have the capability to electrify a much broader spectrum of our boating applications. But unless we do something about the shoreside infrastructure, all we're going to do then is transfer a problem from the boats to the shore. So there's going to have to be a significant investment in shoreside infrastructure to, to make everything, all of this work properly. And people recognize this. There's um, a lot of, um, there's an organization called the Inter International Council of Marine Industry Associations, which is like an international lobbying organization. Um, they're putting in a lot of effort at, at the government level internationally to try and persuade governments that as part of their go green plans and their, their plans to fight global warming, that they'll invest in marine infrastructure so that we can also get the necessary shoreside infrastructure for boating. So let's move on to solar panels. That's my own boat. Uh, looking down on the top of the Bimini, uh, I've got four um, 70 watt solar panels here. Now I have a 24 volt house system. So these are 12 volt panels in series to make 24 volts and two in series to make 24 and then paralleled. And we'll talk a bit about that in a moment because I wouldn't do that again. Um, and those have been up there for 15 years now and they're still putting out close to what they did the day I put them up, but they're rigid panels well mounted um, in an area where nobody walks on them. Um, so they've done pretty well. And then I have a little wind generator on the back. If, if we look at solar panel efficiency, so this is efficiency versus time, uh, with, for the higher end systems, um, these are like 30 different technologies that the FEDs track. So all different ways of making solar energy, but the silicon based ones, which is what we're all using are in the middle here. And if we look at it over time, there's been a fairly steady, almost straight line increase in efficiency. And this is likely to continue for a few more years until we get probably around 30% efficient. Right now, the most efficient cells that we're getting in the boat world are about 25% efficient at converting sunlight into electrical energy. In the past, many of us used thin film solar, which is down here, which is a way of kind of spraying silicon onto a sheet. And it's much cheaper technology, but the efficiency has been flatlined for a couple of decades. So the disparity between the um, other technologies and a thin film has just got wider and wider. And given that we're all short of surface area for solar on boats, uh, almost nobody fits thin film anymore. So I'm not going to even take a look at it. Within the, the uh, solid cell marketplace, there are two cells that we're going to particularly look at. One is called the interdigitated back contact cell, which comes from sun power. And another one is called a hit cell. They're the two highest performing cells that we have in the boat market at the moment. In terms of pricing, 1976, solo was $100 a watt. Today in the home power market, it's well below a dollar a watt. So again, a dramatic reduction in costs. We're not seeing all of that in the boat world. Just in the last 20 years on the home power market, we've gone from $5 a watt to to uh, about 50 cents a watt. So a major, major dip, drop in cost. In terms of efficiency, my panels, which were the, about the best in the marketplace when I put them up 15 years ago, are 16% efficient. The peak efficiency now is 24 to 25%. So that's an 8% improvement in efficiency. 8% doesn't sound like much until you think of it as 8% of, of based on 16 as a starting point, that's a 50% improvement in efficiency, um, which means that for a given surface area, we can get 50% more energy out of it now than we could 15 years ago. So that's a big shift. And then in terms of the cost per watt in the home power market, I just put 14 and a half kilowatts of solar on a building in Maine, and it cost me just over $2 a watt, all inclusive. Well, I got a pretty good deal, but still. Um, 
you can you can do all of this, including the inverters and everything, for less than three dollars a watt in the home power market. In the boat market, we're typically looking at anywhere from two to ten dollars a watt for solar panels, depending on the manufacturer and whether they're flexible and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, two would be very much at the bottom end of the market. Um, to more likely, you're talking somewhere between five and ten dollars a watt. So still pretty pricey. Now let's do a little arithmetic. I've got a 48 foot uh, Marlowe built in Sweden. It takes seven kilowatts to move my boat at six knots in flat water. So no waves, no uh, headwinds. So if I want to putter around at seven knots for two hours, I need 14 kilowatt hours of energy to do that stored on the boat, either diesel or batteries, however I store it. Crudely speaking, it takes 22 square feet of surface area to generate one kilowatt hour of solar electricity a day. Uh, and this is a pretty good ballpark number. So to get my 14 kilowatt hours to putter around in flat water with no waves for two hours, I need 300 square feet of solar panels. Well, as I can't fit them on the boat, there's no way. So. This gives you a sense of the challenge we've got when we're trying to generate non-fossil fuel energy on a boat for propulsion purposes. Now, I can generate all the electricity I need for house loads for the fridge and the lights and so on, but not for propulsion. And then if I get into some uh, really nasty conditions and I go to wide open throttle, because of that hull resistance curve, the way it's shaped, my propulsion load goes to more than 40 kilowatts. So, uh, and then I'm gonna burn through a day's worth of solar power in just a few minutes. Uh, and uh, we don't have a, a way around us at the moment. And then if I want to have electric propulsion and I had it on the boat for test purposes for, for uh, two or three years, we've tested a whole bunch of electric motors and generators and stuff. Um, but uh, as soon as I've exhausted the batteries, I need a generator. And then I discover that if I took that diesel engine that's driving the generator and I attached it to my propeller, it would have to be more efficient than using that diesel engine to run a generator to charge a battery to drive an electric motor. So uh, the, the whole thing starts to kind of fall apart from a conceptual perspective. And then we've still got house loads that we've got to feed. So within the solar world, we have mono, we've got two types of solid crystal cells, monocrystalline and polycrystalline. The monocrystalline, monocrystalline you can tell instantly because they're always black, they're a uniform color the polycrystalline uh, uh, got this kind of grain structure that you can see and they have this bluish tint. The difference between them is when they make a, a cell, they create an ingot of solid silicon and they slice it up. And the monocrystalline, they, they manufacture their ingot in a way that all of the, the crystal structure is aligned in the same direction and it makes the, the uh, resulting cells theoretically more efficient than a polycrystalline. Uh, and you get an, a circular ingot like this. With the polycrystalline, they melt down the silicon and then they cast it into a block with square edges. So if you've got a round cylinder and you want to slice it into cells and make a panel, you've got all these circular cells, you've got all these air spaces between the cells, which is a surface area you're not using. So then they take that round cylinder and they slice the edges off it to square it up. Um, but that adds a lot of cost because that's a lot of waste material. So typically speaking, they don't quite slice all of it off, which is why you see these little white spaces on the monocrystalline panels, because to get rid of all of that, you'd have to slice quite a bit more material off that ingot. With the uh, polycrystalline, they can just slice them up. So then after they've sliced them, they test them for efficiency. And because even with a high-end monocrystalline cell, when you slice it up, there's gonna be differences in the efficiency of the cells they make. So they test them and they bin them. So the, the highest quality ones go in the 24% bin and the low ones in the 15% bin. They all look identical, but they go into different bins and the same with the polycrystalline. So the bottom line is uh, people will tell you that a monocrystalline panel is, is bound to be more efficient than a polycrystalline, it's simply not true. If you're using a low efficiency cell from a monocrystalline panel versus a high efficiency cell from a polycrystalline, uh, then the polycrystalline is gonna be better. The only thing you can say is that at the top end, the best of the monocrystallines are better than the best of the, the polycrystallines. 
So then we take a wafer of silicon, which is like a really thin piece of glass, and we've got to get electrons in and out of it. So we paste tiny little fingers. If you look closely at these solar cells, you'll see these tiny skinny little fingers of silver actually that we, we paste onto the cell and we bake into the cell and they, they collect electricity. And then we put on a bus bar like this that's fastened to the fingers. And that's how we collect all the electrons out of the cell. And each cell puts out about a half a volt, a little bit over, and we need to build the voltage up to battery charging voltages. So we take the top of one cell and we connect it to the bottom of the next. We're going from negative to positive. And then we keep doing that because every time we make a serious connection like that, we double the voltage and then we boost the voltage until we get to the voltage we want. So we series up the cells to get to voltage. And then the output is a function of the surface area of the individual cells in terms of the amperage. So the bigger the individual cells, the, the greater the amperage. So that's how we build the panels. And if we look closely here, these are the fingers that I mentioned that are baked into the cell to collect the electrons. These are the bus bars. And if you look here, you can see this bus bar is going under the next cell. So that's the series connection. Here we've got the fingers, here we've got the bus bars, and here we're going under the next cell to make the series connection. To get to charge a 12 volt battery historically, and this is not true anymore, but I'll come to that. We've always wanted to get the voltage up around 20 volts so that we've got some cushion for shading and other losses and still have a high enough voltage to charge the battery. So we typically, we've got one, two, three, four, five, two. We've, we've got eight times four, 32 cells in series here, but um, just over half a volt each, that gets uh, up around 20 volts to charge a 12 volt battery. If we want a smaller panel, we still need the same number of cells because the voltage is dependent on putting that number of cells in series. So we have to chop these cells in half so that we can fit the same number of cells into a smaller panel. And that's why you'll see in small panels, they have lots of half cells or even sometimes sm smaller than that. So here we've got half cells and we can tell that this is monocrystalline because we've got the little white spaces in the corners. They didn't fully square the ingot. And then we've got again, nine or eight or nine times four. So 32 or 36 in series to get the voltage up. But then the output is half of a, of a full size cell panel because we've got half size cells. So this is all by way of background. Now the, the primary failure mode of, of uh, solar panels in home power use is through failure of the solar joints between the bus bars and the fingers or through breaking of the connections because we've got differential heating and, ex and expansion and contraction of the various elements in the solar panel and it physically stresses everything. So the failure mechanism is, is, is a breaking out of the connection between the bus bars and the fingers and the silicon or even if we break these bus bars, but many of these cells only have two bus bars. If we snap a bus bar, or two bus bars, the panel's dead. Because in a series connection, you break one connection, uh, you lose the whole series. So that's the primary failure mechanism. In the boat world, of course, we use a lot of semi-flexible panels and we make this even worse because we've got this constant movement as well, which is just stressing things. And then on top of that, on the backside of these cells, almost all of them have a thin sheet of aluminum, which is part of the energy collection process. And if we get any moisture intrusion, the aluminum corrodes and then we've got corrosion issues. So the cell to beat for years in, in both the home power and the boat world has been the sun power IDC cell that I mentioned earlier, the peak efficiency of which is around 24, 24 and uh, These cells are quite interesting. Um, they don't have any of the fingers and bus bars on the front of the cell. The, the negative and positive connections are all on the underside of the cell. So you can immediately tell a sun power panel because the entire surface area of the cells is black. There's no bus bars, there's no fingers. Everything, all the connection is done on the back. And then on the back, they have a, a copper backing sheet instead of aluminum. Um, so that's uh, more rugged than most other panels. And then because they're making the connections edge to edge on the bottom of it, and they're not having to go from the top to the bottom, uh, they've got a much bigger surface area to make that connection 
and they've got a much more reliable connection between cells. So for a number of reasons, the, the panels with sun power cells have been the panels to beat for a couple of decades now. Uh, but you, again, you have to be cautious. Sun power has the same process as other manufacturers of slicing the silicon and then binning it based on efficiency. So people can go into the, the marketplace and they can buy 15% sun power cells, which look just like 24% sun power cells. And they can tell you, um, you that they're building a sun power panel at 24% efficiency and it's simply not true. Uh, in the home power world, these panels all have to be built and tested to pretty rigorous standards. And they have to maintain 80% of their output for 25 years. In the boat world, we do not have a single standard that we can point to that we can say that if that panel has been tested to this standard, it's a good panel. So it's very much a case of buyer beware in the boat world. Uh, this is a graph of cell cost to the panel manufacturer. So this is not to us. We look at the uh, traditional Chinese players, they're selling cells of between 20 and 40 cents uh, a, uh, a watt, a watt hour to the, um, a watt rather, to the panel manufacturer. And then you look at SunPower, they're high end cells. They're uh, $140, $1.40, $1.50. Dollar so a, a huge price differential between what you can buy from a cheap Chinese supplier and what it would cost you to buy a high end SunPower cell. And that's why uh, a number of these panel manufacturers are dishonestly um, using lower power sun power cells and uh, claiming that they've got the full efficiency of the high end cells. These are some sun power panels. Again, absolutely completely black. There's no uh, fingers or bus bars, bus bars, or laminated panels. And then I, I want to look at the edge to edge connections. But uh, even for sun power in home power applications, solder failure is the dominant end of life failure mode. So it's again, it's that differential expansion and contraction with changes in temperature, um, maybe a little bit of movement and things start to crack and break. We are looking at the backside of two sun power cells here where we're making the connections. And sun power uses something called a dog bone connector, which is this strip here. And then it gets soldered. It's not in place at the moment, it's just laid loose. And it gets soldered here and here and here to each cell. And it, it makes this long, connector, which is way more rugged than these kind of connectors that we've got on other panels. But take a look at this SunPower cell and panel, not built by SunPower, built by somebody else using their cells. We can just see that little slot here, which is the edge of the dog bone. We can see the solder joint right on top of the dog bone where it's supposed to be. But look, this solder is, is right here. It missed it completely. Um, and then this one, it's kind of off, off to one side here. So it doesn't matter how good the quality of the cells, if the person building the panel is doing a sloppy job, they're, they're gonna build in problems from the get go. Uh, and so the bottom line in all of this is that you should be buying from reputable manufacturers with a decent warranty. And unfortunately, the, the best kind of warranty you can get in the boat world is five years. Uh, and then you need to make sure that it's not prorated because if the panel fails after four years and it's prorated, they're only gonna give you 20% of the replacement cost. So you want a full replacement um, for at least five years. About two years ago, we, we had a new cell connection technology come into the marketplace, which is called a Merlin MTAT. And I can't remember what the acronym stands for. It comes from a company in California Instead of having your traditional bus bars on the top of a cell, they've got these wavy copper bus bars. So all these little wiggles in the bus bar uh, uh, take account of expansion and contraction stresses. So they make this much more rugged system. And then there's, these bus bars are thinner than normal, but there's a lot more of them. And then they're soldered. Uh, on the top of most cells, there are 2000 connection points. They've actually driven pickup trucks over some of these panels and crushed the cells and still got a pretty fair percentage of the output from them because there's so many connection points between the grid structure and the silicon that they can still extract the electrons from little broken bits of silicon. And then between the cells from one cell to the next, they've got this structure here with hundreds of little 
flexible connections. So this is by far the best grid structure we've got, especially for semi-flexible and flexible panels in the boat market. It's a, it's a very rigid, rigid uh, not rigid, a very reliable mechanism. And this is kind of what it looks like. And the finished panels will look something like this. And, um, and then we also have a new cell technology that's come into the marketplace, which is a Panasonic heterojunction with intrinsic thin layer, HIT cells. Uh, these actually have a slightly higher efficiency than the sun power cells, but it's like half a percent, it's, it's insignificant, but uh, they're super efficient cells. So the combination of Panasonic HIT cells and the Merlin MTAT grid structure uh, assuming that the panel manufacturer as a quality manufacturer and is doing a good job, makes for um, what are the best solar panels in the market right now and significantly better than what we've had in the past. That's what they look like. So the other area where there's been some significant innovation is in the controller side of this. I think most of you know that we've had maximum power point tracking controllers for, for years. It's a mechanism to optimize the output of the solar panel in poor light conditions. So uh, regardless of what we do, we want an MPPT regulator. Uh, they used to have a, an efficiency through the regulator when they first came out of about 85%. So most of what you gained through the MPPT process, you lost in the heat in the reg in the controller. But nowadays these things are 95, 98, 99% efficient. So that's no longer an issue. Uh, but the other development we've got is that in the home power market, we series up panels to high voltage. It's not uncommon to have three or 400 volts because that way we can get away with smaller conductors coming down and we won't get into why. Um, so, but on uh, boats, we've always historically set the panels at the voltage of the batteries we're charging. But we're beginning to see controllers in the marketplace, particularly from Victron coming out of the home power marketplace that will take up to hundred volts on the input side and drop it down to whatever we want, 12 or 24 or 48. So we're starting to see people series up panels on boats to higher voltage and then dropping it down with these, um, these uh, regulators to whatever they need for charging batteries. However, I would recommend strongly against doing that because if there's any kind of shading issues or other issues on a boat that interfere with the output of any one panel, if you series the panels, it screws up all of the panels in the series. So that's not a smart way to do a boat. It works on homes because we make sure there's no shading. Uh, but the other technology, which is really worthwhile, is to go in the other direction. We now have regulators or controllers that can take a low voltage, you could have a panel say with nine volts and we'll boost it to 12 or 24 or 48 or whatever we need for charging the batteries. So if we've got a little panel, we want a panel this size, instead of chopping up solar cells into little pieces till we get 36 of them so that we've got the voltage for charging our 12 volt battery, we can put say nine cells in there, full size cells producing five volts and then we can boost that up to whatever we want, 12, 24, 48, uh, to charge our batteries. And uh, we can gain significant efficiency benefits by using full-size cells in lower numbers and then boosting the voltage for battery charging purposes. And at the moment, the only company I know that there's two of them that are doing these boost regulators. One is Jenison, and I'm, I'm having a bit of a senior moment. I can't remember the other one, but if you, if you do a hunt for solar power boost regulators, you'll find the other one. The Jenison regulators, by the way, are terrific. Um, they, and uh, they're not that expensive anymore. So this is a very worthwhile technology to invest in. So historically, we've put, as I say, all the cells in series that we need to get the battery charging voltages, and then we drop the voltage down with our controller to charge the battery. Um, well, a lot of us are still doing it that way. If we've got two panels, we have the option to tie them together uh, through diodes to a single controller. But if we do that, and either one of these panels has a problem, it's shaded or whatever, it screws up the performance of both of them. Um, and then this is an MPPT controller, which now can't be optimized for either one of the panels. So 
although we have done this quite a bit in the past, it's very highly recommended to put individual controllers on the panels. And that will improve the, particularly if you've got any shading issues or angle issues or whatever um, that are gonna affect the panels differentially. But this will substantially improve the overall performance of the system. A gunboat catamaran with 12 solar panels, six on each side. Um, we've got six here and six there. Individual controllers on each panel. And then the output of each controller is brought to a negative and positive bus bar. And then we go back to the batteries. So here we've got a fully optimized system in which any problem on any panel is not going to affect any of the other panels in the system. On my own boat, as I mentioned, I have um, two 12 volt panels in series for 24 volts because my house system is 24 volts. Uh, at the time I did this 15 years ago, there were none of these boost regulators. So one of my projects is to separate the panels and to take them back down to individual units and put a boost regulator on each one. And I also, at the moment, my primary energy storage system on the boat is actually 48 volts. So I'll break down my panels into single units and then I'll put a boost regulator on each one that goes to 48 volts and I'll charge the batteries that way. And I, I will improve the output of my system um, averaged out by at least 25% by doing that. I mean, it'll be a significant boost in, in performance. One other technology I'm gonna mention and something called electroluminescence testing. You can backfeed a solar panel with low levels of electricity and with a special camera, an electroluminescence camera, you'll pick up defects in the panel immediately. They show up as dark spots. In this case, we're looking at a single cell and every one of these black dots is the connection point for the grid that goes on the cell. Uh, but if you take a whole panel and backfeed it and electroluminescence test it, this is, these are brand new panels right out of the packaging with an electroluminescence camera and every single one of these dark areas is a defect in the panel, which is affecting the performance. And in fact, this uh, panel was rated at 120 watts and it's putting out 107. Um, these are all defects. This panel was rated at 95 watts and it's putting out 72 watts. Um, here's a couple more. These are all defects. And these are, these are resistance in the edge to edge connection on the cells that I talked about earlier, the uh, serious connections. Some panel manufacturers will electroluminescence test their panels before they ship them. So, and that way they can make sure that the panel itself is um, perfect basically before it leaves the factory. Now that's no guarantee it won't get damaged in shipping. But uh, that's something worth looking for because otherwise you as a as the customer have no way of knowing whether that panel is performing up to spec. And lastly, we have a technology called perovskite solar. It uses a, di a different kind of materials for making solar panels, which uh, we now have efficiency comparable to what we're getting out of silicon, 25.5%. And the efficiency keeps creeping up. It's predicted to go to 30 plus percent, uh, which, is, which is about where we are expecting the silicon to go in the next few years. It's much cheaper to produce panels from this material. Uh, however, up until now, they've been unable to get decent life expectancy out of perovskite solar panels. But the life expectancy of these panels is going up quite rapidly. There's a ton of R&D going on in the solar world with perovskite. So it may be within uh, two or three or four or five years that in actual fact, we see our solar panels supplanted by this perovskite technology. So it's something to keep an eye on. So that's all I have from you. As I mentioned at the beginning, I think we're going to one of those historical periods where there's a huge ferment, intellectual ferment, that is driving all kinds of technology changes and development. And uh, it's gonna keep going for, if it doesn't keep going, we're all in trouble with, with global warming. Um, and so I think we're probably living through an era which is comparable to the shift from coal and steam to diesel in terms of energy needs, except now we're going to shift our energy to electrification. And we're gonna do it hopefully quite quickly. 
And um, when we're when you're living through something like this, it maybe doesn't seem like it's happening that fast. But I think we're going to look back in five years time and say, whoa, uh, this is a lot different than what we had in 2022.